Jimmy, first of all, thank you for hosting, and thank you uh, for protecting Obamacare. I really do appreciate it. <laughs> Having had two brothers with Valerie work on it, it's truly incredible what you've been doing. Lawrence, thank you for coming and doing it. And Mark, thank you for your friendship. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and thank you, Laura Jean, uh, for uh, this great honor. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this, in Lori's previous life, she worked at FEMA um, in disaster relief in between Houston, what's going on in Florida, and what's going on in Puerto Rico, and especially what's going on in Washington. I think um, they're probably going to want to recruit, recruit you, Lori, but uh, I don't think so. Uh, what you've done here is amazing, um, and you're a role model for a lot of people. I, sp I spent a lifetime looking up to strong women like Lori, women like my mother, who spent hour after hour, day after day, helping me learn how to read because I was dyslexic. My mom's the one who taught me and my brothers that there's no excuse for hard work and doing the right thing. She's the one that taught me that thinking differently was a virtue, not a problem. Those values led my mom in the 60s and 70s to march for civil rights and take three young boys downtown Chicago. They led my dad, a pediatrician, to work to remove lead paint that was poisoning kids in Chicago. My parents taught me that when you look out into the world and you see something wrong, even if it doesn't affect you, it does affect you. And you can, and you must, and you should do something about it. That lesson, I'll admit, took a little while to sink in. Growing up, I know it's hard to imagine, I had a chip on my shoulder. Of the three Emanuel brothers, Zeke was always the brainy one. Ram was the shrewd one, and well, I, I was just the last one. I wish it was funny at the time. As I mentioned, I struggled with, with dyslexia and also, as Mark mentioned, ADHD. So when my parents told us, as the boys, that you had to do your part to help other people, I sometimes thought, come on, don't I have enough on my shoulder? It wasn't until I was 14 that my parents' wisdom started to break through. It was a few years later that my cousin Gary came to live with us. It wasn't unusual in the Emanuel house to just show up and move in. My, man, my mom ran an open house and often people stayed over even for months at a time if they were having troubles in their own home. At first, that was all I knew about Gary's situation that he wasn't welcome in his own home. Eventually, I put things together, and I realized Gary was gay, which, as you know, wasn't something many people talked about openly in the 70s. I didn't think it occurred to me to ask Gary a bunch of questions about his life, and I'm not sure how I would have reacted if he told me. I just didn't have any context. Besides, I love Gary. He was our oldest and closest cousin. We had been hanging out and going on trips, going to movies, going to the beach with my grandfather ever since I was born. Later, Gary moved to Boston. He was a pioneer who was rehabbing and re-energizing Boston South End before it was cool, and he and I lost touch. Then in the late 80s, Gary got sick, and there were hospital visits, and there were whispers, and there were a lot, a lot of pills. Before long, it was clear that Gary wasn't going to make it. I remember the last event where he was in public and I was with him. He was at Bill Clinton's 1993 inauguration. My brother, Ram worked on the campaign and was going into the White House. 
Gary dressed in a floor-length gold-brown fur coat. He killed it. He threw himself into everything at that inauguration, enjoying the shows and the dinner. But it was hard for him to summon up the energy. It was coming close to the end. When Gary was in hospice, I spent many nights there saying goodbye. You know, the cruelty of AIDS in those days wasn't just the suffering or the few therapists. It was the silence. The feeling that you just couldn't talk civilly or maturely about the disease because it was something, a source of shame and embarrassment. It was either yelling and demanding more attention for AIDS or whispers and winks. Thankfully, we're a long way from those days, not just in terms of preventing AIDS, but with advancements in treatment and ending the stigma around HIV. There's still more to do, but in most places in this country, gay people no longer have to hide. And for that, for that progress, we have organizations like the Center to thank. From kids who have run away from home to members of the trans community, you provide everything from legal support, a warm bed, education, and hospital work. You've been fighting for and winning legal rights, whether we're talking about marriage, adoption, or non-discrimination laws. You've been pushing back against attacks on this community, wherever they come from. But when I think back to Gary's story, it's clear that laws can only do so much. True equality means unconditional love. It means inclusion instead of isolation. It means potential instead of powerlessness. Gary needed to look out and see a culture that looked like him, like young people do today. He needed trailblazers like Jason Collins in sports, Tim Cook in business, Tammy Baldwin in politics, and Ellen DeGeneres in entertainment. We all need trailblazers to tell their stories and tell them proudly. Because otherwise, it's, vi it's villains like Anita Bryant who have the megaphone. Or the current vice president, when he was governor of Indiana, who was hawking conversion therapies and giving employers and businesses a license to discriminate. Everybody here knows that's not an isolated case. In July, on the anniversary of President Truman's executive order to ban racial discrimination in the military, the current president tweeted that he was going to ban transgender persons from serving in the military. You know what he called people, he, you know what he called this group of Americans? The group of Americans that were willing to fight and die for this country? He called them a burden. That's just not a misunderstanding of history. It's an attempt to take us back to the past, to roll back the progress we've made in this country. So no matter what and how things have changed, my mom's advice still matters a lot. If you see something wrong, even if it doesn't affect you directly, your voice matters. Your actions matter even more. You've got to act to do the right thing and be an example for others to do the same. I try to do that in my life. Okay, most people don't know me, but nobody comes into my office for unconditional love. <laughs> I promise you that's true. But the work we do in the entertainment industry gives us a unique responsibility. We have a massive platform and powerful tools at our disposal. The power to decide through the movies and television shows we make whether entire communities are celebrated or overlooked. The power to share their stories and their humanity. So I accept this, year, this year's Vanguard's Award with deep gratitude for the work of the center and with real humility, 
about the modest contribution to this cause. Mostly, I appreciate the chance to keep on learning and working even harder. And I appreciate the chance you've given me tonight to share my story of Gary with all of you and to share the story of our relationships, his struggle, and to reflect on the social progress he would have been so excited and proud to see. I want to use this award to honor his memory. Thank you. Hold on. I'm not done. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that in mind, I leave you with this promise. A promise to use my role to tell true stories of this community and other communities. And a promise to speak up where I see injustice and never wait to do the right thing. So thank you very much for this honor. Thank you. Right.